Welcome to Women Lead, a production of the Women of Color Empowerment Institute. We are your hosts. I'm Michelle Austin Tammy. I'm Kathy Eggleston. And I'm Bernadette Norris Weeks. Everyone wants to be a star, and lots of people dream of making it in Hollywood. Of course, it is challenging to make that dream a reality. The competition is stiff. And it can be even more challenging to make it as a director than as an actor. But all that being said, today we have with us a woman who's been able to do it all. She was successful in Hollywood as an actress, as a director, and as a singer. Her name is Vanessa Estelle Williams. You will know her as Maxine in the hit series Soul Food. You'll also know her as Keisha in the hit film New Jack City. Well, she's done a lot more than that, and we can't wait to speak with her right after these messages. So stay tuned for Vanessa Estelle Williams. At the Women of Color Empowerment Institute, our mission is to enhance and expand leadership by women of color. We do this in a variety of different ways, including but not limited to providing mentorship opportunities for young professionals where we assist in helping to create paths to leadership. We empower women to develop capacities for social change. We produce programs that promote heritage awareness, and we provide training opportunities for business and government. Our institute holds seminars focused on professional success techniques, and we host many other events such as our popular Advocates for Change and Leaders Connect. The Women of Color Empowerment Institute publishes a magazine called Women Lead. Our signature event is the Women of Color Empowerment Conference, a yearly conference where hundreds of leaders gather from all across the United States and beyond. To learn more about membership and how you can support our programs or be a sponsor of the Women Lead TV, visit us at nationalwomenofcolor.com. Again, that's nationalwomenofcolor.com. The law office of Austin Pammy's Norris Weeks Powell is a full service law firm practicing in the area of governmental law including the representation of municipalities, civil litigation, personal injury, real estate, and corporate transactional matters. With over 100 years of collective experience, our attorneys are admitted to practice before state courts, federal courts, and the United States Supreme Court. We are conveniently located in downtown Fort Lauderdale and can be reached at 954 954- 768-9770. Or for more information about the law firm of Austin Pammy's Norris Weeks Powell, visit our website at APNWLaw.com. That's APNWLaw.com. Welcome back to Women Lead. Today our guest is none other than Vanessa Estelle Williams of Soul Food Series fame. Welcome to the show, Vanessa. Welcome. Thank you. Thank Welcome you so Vanessa. very much. I'm so pleased to be here. We're we excited. We are pleased <laughs> to, have you and, to have you talk to us a little bit about your career and your accomplishments oh. and just what you've done in the entertainment industry generally. But I'd like to start by asking you how you became Vanessa Williams. How did you Vanessa enter? Estelle Williams. Yes. <laughs> we have to clarify. Okay. Yes. Vanessa Williams from the Soul Food the movie, but Vanessa Estelle Williams from Soul Food the series. So how did you decide that this is what you wanted to do in life? Oh my and goodness. Um, what was your first opportunity? Sure. I mean, my goodness, we're going back to the little long cabin, right? <laughs> All I mean, the way back. Yeah, exactly. Because Soul Food, of course, wasn't my first job. You know, I, I grew right. up in New York, in Brooklyn, best side, do or die. Brooklyn. Brooklyn all day. And so, and so um, my, my beginnings are humble. Um, grew up in, in a, a home in Brooklyn. My, my mom died when I was a little girl, when I was 10 years old, and raised by her mother, my wonderful grandmother. And so my first entry into the business was singing. I sang opera as a child for wow. the New York City Opera. Oh, that's awesome. oh my goodness. Yeah, New York City Opera Children's Course, my, my, my middle brother and I. And um, I was trying to figure out a way how to get into the TV, like how to do, you know, that was like, 
an impossible, you know, sort of dream. Like, how does one do it? And I was able to start singing chorus in um, in my school productions and in school and all the after school and then Saturday enrichment programs in my community. So shout out for all of those, you know, wonderful performing arts enrichment programs that were government sponsored and in, in my school and my community. And uh, this wonderful woman, Mildred Honer, came into the community uh, looking for boy sopranos from all over you know, New York, and my brother and another friend from school got into the chorus, and when I saw that she, he was, my, my younger brother was singing, um, I was like, I wanna do this too, and so I, I auditioned, but mainly I wanted to, I didn't realize I was auditioning for the chorus itself, I was auditioning to you know, giving her like a taste of my, of my talents so that I could get into the industry, like get on the TV. And um, then she asked me if I wanted to be in the opera course, and I was like, um, I don't know if I want to sing opera, but I felt like it would be a stepping stone and a way in, and so and so I said yes. Yeah. So that's where I got my beginnings. And there was another young um, young uh, member of the chorus who was working there and doing commercials. And I was like, that that's what I want to do. Laura, who's your agent? Like, what's a manager? All these things. And so I got signed with her um, manager who would connect me to the agent, who connected me to the auditions. And my, my second audition, I booked a, a, a Lay's um, commercial for, um, it's Italian, what was it? Like a, like a tortilla chip kind of thing? Mm -hmm. Not a Pringle, but oh gosh, I, mm -hmm. I haven't even thought about this in so long. But it was like a tortilla chip, and, and it just started like this whole wave of like, oh, the, the, the manager tells you where the auditions are. I was going into the city, I started booking commercials. My very big first famous hit, my first like entry with Bane, was um, the Bubble Yum commercial. <laughs> and so, it was, and they were doing rap, so it was rap. You're from New York, you remember that? <laughs> 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 I mean, it was so fun. But it was like a like, long, long time. <laughs> <laughs> Before the bushy. judge, yes, yes, before the judge, because, bushy. well, it was always bushy because there were black people from all parts of the diaspora in terms of the financial, you know, um, demographic, okay. and so there were lawyers and doctors as well as people who worked, you know, as as um, manual workers, factory workers, which my grandmother did. So um, they were all. It was always bushy in terms of like there the being a mix of middle class, a mix of working class. You know, you're talking about gentrification. Yes, with now, the yeah, yeah, that's now the you're speaking of. What but I yeah, I, I'd say I'm from, I'm from Biggie, Brooklyn. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I tell you, 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 you did tell us that you started with singing uh -huh. and you went into commercials. What was your first so my TV? First TV was The Cosby Show. Oh, wow. And at that time, to book big. The Cosby Show that's oh, huge. was like, man, oh. Oh my goodness! And uh, it shot in Queens in Astoria, Queens. You're wow. from Queens, right? I have a Queens and, village. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's where the studio was. So it was like this amazing world of of, of really the big time. I had done a, a number of uh, plays because uh, you know, as an actor in New York, it's not sexy, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're grunging, you're out there auditioning for whatever is available, from TV commercials to the theater to and going back and forth and all of it. And so to book the Cosby Show was like. You know, such a such an amazing thing. It still sounds it, it, was, it was so <laughs> thrilling. It was so thrilling, and um, uh, you know, so that was like my first, you know, big TV TV thing. And all it takes is that one big first, right? Well, it takes that big first, and then it takes them keep cup to yes, keep coming. Yes, yes. <laughs> so that's a beautiful. I'm grateful for um, the breaks to lead to more breaks. Well, you talked about your history and your background and how you got into the business, mm -hmm. but I'm wondering, as a woman of color, there must have been some obstacles that you would have faced, and if so, what were those? Certainly, you know, um, like my mindset is to focus on the solution and the mm -hmm. way in. You know, that's my spiritual breakdown, our spiritual breakdown mm -hmm. as women of color. Right. Somebody says, no, we keep going. We said, let me find another way. Let me find a way around your no. So I don't even, the, the challenges were were numerous, you know, in terms of like getting to the city, um, uh, you know, being the type, the right type, you know, for whatever role they were looking for. But but I feel like tenacity mm -hmm. is a superpower for all of us who are look for dreaming bigger than what we can see. Our faith is um, how, how we uh, get over whatever the limitations. And so if we uh, maneuver past the limitations of our mind and what society says or things says or how challenging things can be, you know, we just don't take no for an answer. 
Um, so I don't really remember, except that, you know, I just had to keep getting up every time they knocked me down. And, um, yeah, that's what, that's what comes to mind, the, like, how I got over it. And I, sometimes so, that's a survival um, mechanism in and sure, of itself, right? For sure, yeah. for sure. Yeah. I mean, I'm trying to remember, like, I, they fired me from, from Melrose Place after the first season. Mm -hmm. Like, there are some gut-wrenching losses yeah. Yeah. when I didn't book um, uh, Waiting to Exhale. Mm -hmm. I got really, really close. The casting director would see me on many, many things, didn't even recognize me when I came in with long flowing hair and da 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 da. You know, but another actor got that. So you so as an actor you build up a callus of like, keep going, keep going. Like it doesn't matter if you if you really and, and I and I studied acting from perform, going to performing arts high school. So we really learned about the craft and being an artist, you know, so it wasn't just about like the fame. The fame was was effective in that it got you another job, another job, but it was really about the work and the mm -hmm. opportunity, the sacred opportunity to be an artist, to 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 do the narrative, to embody the person of black women. Right. Yeah. You know, and I've had the opportunity to embody so many black women that I don't take anything for granted and I feel such a privilege to to be able to do so many different kinds of characters. Um, and and so that is the divine opportunity, right? That that I that I get a chance to go. So the calling is to just keep going and not say oh, for the rest of my life. That's you know? right. Like, yeah. They need a ninety year old too. That's right. Them, you know what I mean? That's right. So I want to I want to take you back into that initial seed because at some point you are a very young child, mm -hmm. and somebody around you has to say, hmm, this child has talent and is attracted to a certain direction of things, and I am going to support that. Yes. I'm not gonna stifle that. Yes. And so, how did that happen, and kind of a follow-up, and then early on in your professional career, was there a, a mentor professionally who helped you through those I rough had, patches? I had so many supporters and people who saw a vision of me that poured into me, you know, starting from my grandmother, who Johnny Mae Munchen is her name, and she took up the mantle of parenting myself and my three brothers uh, once my mother passed, when, as I said, when I was 10 years old. She herself, I had so many creatives, you know, we're all creatives, we all have like a, this is who we are as God's children, right? The divine creator lives in all of us and how we express it. And so my mother was a dancer, mm -hmm. Vernell Williams, Munjin Williams. Um, my auntie, her oldest sister was an uh, opera singer. Um, she went, then went on and got married. And so, and my grandmother was an accomplished pianist. Mm -hmm. She played for W.C. Oh. Handy and, and the Savoy. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, so they all, mm -hmm. you know, were, were, were expressing their, um, and it was also sort of the, the vital vitamin that was part of our, our, our culture at, at the house, you know. <laughs> I grew up with a piano in my house, and I went to another friend's house when I was young, and I mean, so much so that I thought a piano was like a piece of furniture, like the couch. Okay. Like, I didn't know that other people didn't necessarily have a piano in their house. And um, I was like, oh, you know, so this was like part of, you know, how we get down, right? Like, And a lot of black families had that, right, yes, at that time. Yes, yeah. exactly, and, 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 some, and some didn't. So what I'm saying is like, you know, my, my family was always pouring into me. So mm -hmm. the fact that my grandmother, you know, didn't squelch, you know, my desire and saw it and, took, mm -hmm. and sent me to sing opera and sent me to the, the after school programs and such like that. And then there were people in those programs and, and my teachers, my like elementary school teachers, Mrs. Bowles, who I just reunited with about three years ago, she lives in Brooklyn, still in Brooklyn, who took me to my first play. Like she took me to see um, Tree Manisha, the, uh, the um, a Scott Joplin opera. She took me to see For Colored Girls. And then to fast forward later and get to befriend and work with and, and be taught by Intizaki was just like a full circle moment. So um, Lorraine, Bowles, Mitchell, who was, who was my, 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 my junior high school teacher, took me to my first place in New York. And for a little girl growing up at Bed-Stuy, that was not like a normal 
thing to do. You know, we were all being exposed. So, so many heroes and sheroes in my life that fed me and fed my art and saw a vision of me. Um, my One of my wonderful elementary school teachers who lived on Staten Island, Irene Alter. You see, I know all my teachers. <laughs> yes, you do. teachers out there, Impressive. you are doing divine, <laughs> your God's work. And I love that people. calling their names. Yeah, oh, exactly. I call their exactly. names. I call their names because they live in me. And so Irene Alter, um, this wonderful white lady who grew up in uh, um, Staten Island, and she was teaching in bed style with like mostly, you know, all black class, all black students. But her heart and her love for us was so pure and so marvelous. And she took me, on, she took us on outings, you know, to Central Park and stuff like that. And then she later said, you know, she, you know, as a as a child, there were certain adults, my auntie Carol, who who respected me, who respect, you know, because it, there was this um, idea that you know children are to be seen and are heard and spoke when spoken to and all that. And there were certain adults in my life who respected me, who I felt like I was an equal, who noticed and recognized and nurtured my, my quest, my quest for learning, my passion for everything I was passionate about. And they nurtured me and showed me different things. And so Irene, getting back to my teacher, she took us on, on trips and she said, Vanessa, you always saw you know, more than what was there. And you said, you know, we go, go around different neighborhoods in Brooklyn and, 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 and in the city and go like, I wanna live there. And I want, so she said, I always had a vision for myself. And she stayed in my life even after elementary school, you know, from, from junior high and then college, I mean, high school and college. She was uh, really, really vital. And then I went back to her school in Staten Island and spoke to the kids and told them, you're just like me. I'm just like, this is my teacher too. So like, know that there's nothing, no obstacle, no challenge that you can't overcome. So I, I've been blessed very, very much in that way. I'm gonna tell you that the Women of Color Empowerment Institute to which we belong, yes. right? It's all about the sisterhood. Yeah. Okay, and hands. I feel know. that, I feel that. <laughs> yeah, so the, the, re the reason I'm mentioning that is you had that show, the series Soul Food, mm -hmm. where you were all about the sisterhood. Yeah. And you had these women that you worked with for years. The show lasted four years, I think. Yeah, four years, five seasons. Correct. So during that time, you spent a lot of time with these women. How was that sisterhood? Was it all that we saw? Like, was it as good as we saw it? It was better. And do you maintain those relationships? Girl, today? I'm about to tell you. From this conference, I'm going to Melinda's conference. And I was just speaking to Nicole, who I'm going to go to see in a couple of days, to her opening uh, in a Broadway, in a show off Broadway. Um, we, we were sisters in spirit before we met, and then when we met, it solidified. So it was magic. So all that you saw was just the tip of the iceberg of how deep our love for each other went. I mean, we became sisters forever, sisters for life, and that's what we are. We nurture each other's children, each other's dreams, each other's goals and passions. Um, we, we had this thing, I'm so glad you're talking about this. Um, we, we had this thing where we, we nurtured each other's spiritual growth. So being out of, out, of New, out of LA, we were shooting in Canada, so we were sort of like our own little cocoon, right? Because there weren't like a lot of other people who we knew from the industry, you know, visiting the set or what have you. So we would spend a lot of time off camera with each other and lots of time on camera, 16 hour days and such like that. And it was always magic and divine and fun when the three of us were in scenes together. So lovely, lovely. And we each admired each other's work from before we got together. You know, my first year that I saw Nicole in was The Incredible Adventures of Two Girls in Love, and and Melinda in, um, in her movie, um, oh, I can't remember the name of it now, but y'all know what it is. And um, so when we all got together, we were, we were finding like spiritual books and spiritual texts, Florence Schofield Shin, and The Game of Life and How to Play It. And now Melinda has a book called The Game of Life and How to Slay It. We went, oh. we went from praying in the pink light and pulling in the light of God, the divine light of God, to Melinda being the prophet. Her, her, she, Nicole and I were the ones who were introducing a lot of the books. And she was like, what's the book say? And what's this? To the point where we would say, what book say? Book say, as in like we read something in the book, and the book say, the book say this. So that was the running thing between us. And now Melinda wrote her own book say. So we quote book, Melinda's books, Melinda's cards, and we're all so um, vitally important to each other's growth and 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 support. And for sure, it's like the sister circle that I recognize and feel whenever I'm in a room full of black women. I feel, I feel nurtured to that because we know something about what our journey is, what it has taken to, to bust through corporate 
ceilings and structures and so wherever I am and so in the in the Hollywood industry that that corporate ceiling or that you know comes from getting the pay equity you know getting um, getting the role mm -hmm. you know having someone in the room who is writing a narrative that fits your this you know that, that that they decide oh this is this is something that you can tell this is why directing was so fulfilling is so fulfilling to me when i got to write my own narrative and have like a whole room full of people on their a game helping me fulfill my vision of what i had written so what's the difference between directing and producing because i'm wondering uh, whether it requires a different skill set from acting to directing to producing tell us about that the, okay so the difference between producing is like Producing is is uh, sort of the detail oriented, like dotting all the I's, crossing all the T's, and pulling all these different people together. So that's sort of an analytical head. Now directing, and so and then acting is the taking the text off the page, using your your emotional history and background to really make a character come to life. And you 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 get that character through all the things that you lived, and you're looking for delving and trying to find the truth of the moment, truth of the moment, and how that lands on your particular instrument. Because an actor, your body, your voice, all that is your instrument. Directing is sort of bringing all of those things, is bringing all of those things together. So having a head for, oh, the lights have to be here, da, 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 but also being able to like, okay, I'm trying to draw this actor, and it's so fulfilling. Like in a way different than acting is, because it's like all these people are in this team and, and are helping me to, to create the, the, the vision that I'm trying to think. So pulling the right performance out of the actor, um, making sure that the pic having someone who's an expert at how the picture looks, that the blinds are just making that shadow just right. So it's so fulfilling in a way, you know, it's also being a boss, right? Yeah. So everybody's gonna do what you say. <laughs> so, you know, that comes like, you know, like that woman's my heart is a Taurus, right? Tell me uh, how the transition came about. How were you able to do it? Well, you just, well, you don't have to do one thing or the other. Like, this is the whole thing I love about it. It's like, and, 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 right? As a, as a creative, I get, to, you, I get to do more and more and more things. So you add it, you add it. Um, when I got to direct, um, it was a, a short film that, uh, that Showtime uh, was, was um, producing. So I had like, this budget. I, I, I had written the script. Uh, I'm shouting out my girl, um, Shari Poindexter, who is also an amazing, amazing writer, a mother of five. Just a just so many skill sets, and she's a, an OT. I mean, she's got like so many, and then like a marvelous, marvelous writer. So she helped me be a better writer. She taught me how to write. You know, all the secrets, killing your little darlings, and and getting what's on the page, what's crucial, like not wasting any time. Uh, every word, revealing character, revealing story, like all the tenets of being a good script writer and and scene writer. And so um, having all of these experts in their field help me bring this thing together. It's fulfilling in a way, I, Bondi Curtis Hall, who's in my film, I'd said to him, I said, V, how come you didn't tell me how good this feels? How good this feels? But it's also super challenging, right? It's also like wearing all the hats in terms of like, you gotta have an answer for your key grip, for your actor, you know, it's, it's, it's exhausting, but I knew this material so, so well, because I had lived it and I had crafted it. And to, so it's, it was so fulfilling to have, to have that um, come to life. So it's rewarding in a way that's really, really special because, you know, especially directing actors, I had done a number of love scenes by this time that I was directing my <laughs> actress, Lenai Chapman. And so there's this like sense, as black women, we hadn't had, I hadn't had certainly a whole lot of opportunities to be vulnerable. I mean, like physically vulnerable, like literally mm -hmm. naked or doing, simulating a love scene or yeah. having, and that was the other thing that was so marvelous about, about, uh, about soul food was that we got to be fully, fully human. Wear our head kerchiefs um, to bed, washing the dishes, burning the burning the, um, the cornbread, like all these mm -hmm. things of our humanity that was so special for us to to be able to portray just how we get down as black women and all the different demographics that lives in one family. So. Um, what was so special about you know directing my my my, my lead actress in the film, uh, Dents, was to really help her be vulnerable with showing her body, assuring her that this was going to be like a poetic um, vision of, of 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 what I had in mind. It just wasn't going to be gratuitous, you know, sex or gratuitous nudity. It was about like moving the story forward and and and, and tantalizing and in in. Uh, you know, uh, tantalizing and um, 
you know, drawing the audience into the story of a love story and a betrayal and a hurt. So all of it was necessary to make all of that look so beautiful and romantic. And I was very pleased with that. Awesome. And she trusted me. You awesome. know, like that was the thing to like. And because I know what it what it's like to be in front of the camera. Um, because I know it's like to be in front of the camera, I was able to help her get past those those bridges and those those kind of fears with, within herself. Vanessa, I am interested in artificial intelligence. Can you tell us how it's impacting the entertainment industry right now? Oh my goodness, I'm interested in it too. I'm interested in just you know what kind of hologram is. So I'm excited about it. You know, it's it, I'm curious about it. Uh, the main concern for actors and artists and writers and all, all of us in the industry is to be compensated for whatever we've created and not to have like this entity, this artificial entity, replace what we would be doing, what, what only a human being could do. And and if there is such a thing where like there's an avatar or some kind of some kind of technological uh, digital image or artificial, that you own it. That you own your IV, you know, in that in that space. So I'm really curious about how those um, profits will be shared, the ownership will be shared. That is the vital thing that's important to me as I think about AI. But I'm thrilled and excited about it too. I think, however, that nothing will replace human contact and what we get from seeing stories that are envisioned out of a human being. And so all artificial intelligence, as I understand it. Our inputs, our inputs to this artificial thing from you know a human being. So we're never going to go out of uh, out of style and oh, extinct with Bradley. But I think I think that um, some of the guardrails are, are not in place, and and a lot of technology and a lot of AI is not from people like us, and not from a perspective of ours. And so that's always the um, the concern and the sort of. Uh, the thing that we've got to really be um, forthright about in terms of making sure we're in those rooms where those decisions are made, where those algorithms are, are, are created. And there's lots of people online that I follow, Tibbet, I forget her last name, but she talks about the warnings that lots of black women in the tech space have talked about in yes. terms of their needing to be uh, our, our voices, our sensibilities, because these things are being developed by, you know, that don't look like without us. us. Yes, without, mm -hmm. uh, without yes. our perspective. And so right. I think there's an opportunity for us as black people, as black women, to step into that space and create our own algorithms and, and our own sort of artificial um, enhancements that you know speak to our perspective. Because black people are the ones that are doing everything that's innovative. Everything that's particularly American, that's particularly like fantastic, has come from you know, our genius, you know, Mother Africa and her descendants. That's how well, that is a good place to end. We have enjoyed so much having you today, Vanessa Estelle it. Williams. And I know that our viewers have enjoyed it too. And so until the next time, be empowered. <laughs>